And I just pray the Lord get in this thing and give us clarity of thought. Brother Barry, would you open us up, please? Our Father, as we bow in your presence, we come with thankful hearts that we have a place to come to, that we have a teacher that can help us open up your precious word, Lord, and illuminate the scripture, that we can hide them in our heart, take them apply them to our life, be with us, come into this place this morning, my Father, I ask you to do that. I pray that you would touch the teacher, Lord, anoint him. Pray for the pastor this morning, Lord. I pray that you would strengthen him, my Father. And I pray that during the service today, if there's one that may not know you in the free part of sin, I pray this will be the day that they turn their heart life over to you. For all that's accomplished, we'll bow our unworthy heads and give you the praise, Lord. For it's in Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Barry. All right, we are in Romans chapter 2. We finally got through chapter 1. <clears throat> Still dealing with the Gentile here uh, as a group of people. Uh, once again, we're talking about um, things that took place before the cross of Calvary. So God, how he dealt with, with groups of people, whether Jew or Gentile. We're still dealing with the Gentile here. But it, Paul's going to make it a little bit more... Um, personal here, he's going to be talking about any unsaved man, and if you're judging things uh, based on your standard, you're going to be judged by that same standard. And so we're going to read Romans 2, 1 here. He says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Okay, so we can go to Matthew chapter 7. Let's clarify some things here. This is where a lot of people say, Judge not lest you be judged, and all that. Okay, that's you're taking something out of out of context, <clears throat> and I'm going to try to bring these two things into focus here. Matthew seven one: Judge not that ye be not judged. With what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. So, if you were, what's he talking about? He well, if you're going around judging people based on your standards, you're going to be judged by the same standard. That does not say that you should not judge. Now, here's a real simple thing we'll clear up. We'll go to 1 Corinthians here in a moment, but you are to judge things, not people. Okay, we'll deal with those things here in a moment, but the things that somebody's doing, you are to judge that. and You are to judge the things that you're doing in your life. If you were producing the works of the flesh, you were to judge those things yourself. If we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So when people take these things out of context and say, you should not judge, that's wrong. Okay, you're not, we're not talking about absolutes here, but when we're talking about people, this is what he's dealing with. When you're going around and saying, well, this person's doing that and so on and so forth, and they, well, guess what? You're judged by the same standard. Go to, back to Romans chapter 2. I'll give you an example. Let's look at... Verse 21, now he's dealing with the Jew here because he's dealing with the law, but once again, the conscience is a law to you already. Look at verse 21, thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou, uh, thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Okay, well let me just, let me just ask you this. When I ask somebody, you start using the law as a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ, and you say, well, you ever stole anything? Oh no, I've never stole anything. Okay. Generally speaking, that's people don't want to say out. Oh, yeah, they stole something. But okay, here here's the thing: you ever left work early? Say you're getting you're supposed to be getting paid till four o'clock, and you left at three fifty to beat traffic. Did you leave work early? Well, yeah. Okay, then you stole ten minutes of the boss's time. So you say that you don't steal, but you do in fact steal. Okay, you see how that works. So when, when people start getting self-righteous, that's what Paul's dealing with here, self-righteousness. You start saying, well, you know, I've never stolen anything. Oh, I guarantee you. You ever try to steal God's glory? You ever try to steal um, something that God, he gave to you to do something, and you got glorified as far as in people's eyes, and you stole God's glory? I can guarantee you a lot of preachers fall into that category. Amen? Okay, so, so you have to be careful. So that's what Paul's saying here, and the same thing the Lord's saying over there in the Sermon on the Mount. Whatever standard you're putting out, buddy, you're going to be judged by the same standard. Amen? That's why it's so hard to be a pastor or a preacher, but especially a pastor because like pastor said to me a couple weeks ago, he lives in a fishbowl. 
and he lives in a pressure cooker. So everybody sees everything he does and everybody's judging it. Well, okay, that's fine, but I'll tell you what, you're going to be judged by the same standard. So you better be towing the line 100% before you start judging somebody else on some things. Okay, that's where Paul's talking about back over here, somebody being unmerciful. If you don't have mercy in your judgment, well, it's going to be meted out to you again. Well, he's going to say, hey, now, you weren't merciful to this person. You wanted to, you wanted to throw the book at them, right? You wanted to cast stones, but yet you got sin in your life. So guess what? It's going to come back on you. Does that make sense? So don't take the thing out of context. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, he's, the context in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is we're dealing with somebody who over here was taking their father's wife, okay, and, having, and fornicating. And these things were going on within the church, and they were not being judged. Paul said to judge them, the thing. Now, look at 1 Corinthians um, 5, 9. We're not going to teach the whole chapter, but look, he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. And, he qualif and then he clarifies the statement. Yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must he needs go out of the world. In other words, you're going to go out into the lost community, and you're going to work around these people. You're going to have to eat lunch. You're going to have to do so. so use some common sense. He said, you'd have to go out of this world not to be around those things. Then he qualifies it, and he says, But now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or rarely, or a drunkard, or extortioner, which such and one know not to eat. So if a brother's doing those things, it's different. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, he's talking about within the church, but them that are without God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So he's, what's he talking about? The things that they're doing. If they're out there committing fornication, if they're out there committing adultery, if they're out there doing those certain things, you're not even supposed to eat with that person, okay? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things. See the things? Yet he himself is judged no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So how are you supposed to judge things? Based off of what? Based off the book. You're supposed to judge things off the book. So if you see somebody singing a sin unto death, for instance, and it's, we don't know what that is, but I tell you what, there's some things that could lead to death. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. So if somebody's doing those things, you're supposed to judge that and say, hey, brother, hey, you might want to back up. Okay. You need to police your own, is what Paul's saying. God's going to judge the world without. You're supposed to th judge things and police your own within. That's why God gives you a bishop. He gives you a pastor. He has to look out for those things, and he has to deal with those issues. His job is to do those things, okay? And, and, and amongst the, the church, you're supposed to look out for one another. All right, how do you approve those things? Look at Philippians. Look at Philippians chapter, I think it's chapter 1. Okay, look at verse 9, First Philippians 1, 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, under the glory and praise of God. So you were, you were judging things based off of righteous judgment, which is the book. Okay, God separate the light from the darkness. You can learn things, what are we saying, by comparison and contrast. You know what's good and what's not good. Your conscience is going to tell you that unless you have a seared conscience. Okay? So these are common sense things that you have to judge some things in your life. Okay? Um, don't be a fool out there. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But you're going to have to use some judgment, and you're going to have to judge some things, okay? So that's what, uh, what he's talking about over here. But if you have a standard that's so high, and you're judging everything by your standard, let's look out. It's going to come back on you. Because nobody can keep their own standard. 
I can guarantee it. You can sit there and try and try and try, and you're going to fail. And when you do fail, you're going to fall hard. Okay? Let that man think of these stand, take heed, lest he fall, right? Okay, so let's understand that. So he's talking about any lost man who's going over here. He's looking, he's talking about, remember the list we read last week? Verse 20, 129, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covenants, malicious. All those things he's talking about. Okay, you're looking at somebody else doing those things and you're judging them. Well, guess what? I guarantee you, you fit in that list somewhere. Amen? So that's going to come back on your head. If you don't have, if you're not merciful in your judgment, look out. It, it, it can come back to bite you, okay? But let's keep going to Romans chapter 2. He says, but we are sure, verse 2, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. You see the things again? Those things come with the wrath and the children of disobedience. God is going to judge sin. He judged sin at the cross of Calvary, but when, when he comes back at the second advent of Jesus Christ, you better believe he's judging some things. Amen? Okay, so, so all unrighteousness is sin. Okay, and he's going to judge those things, okay? Uh, look, look back at verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? What? Once again, where's my pen? I think I've covered this before. What, what makes God holy? What makes him righteous? Anyone take a stab at that? What's God do? He judges sin. Right? Would you put a man to death for taking some fruit out of a garden and bring death upon all that race of, of that individual? Would you do that? We'd, look, we'd overlook that, wouldn't we? But what was that? It was disobedience. What does that require? Judgment. I told you to do this, you did that. Now, is God merciful? You better believe He's merciful. We're getting into that here in just a moment. But see how God, if He didn't judge sin, He wouldn't be holy. He wouldn't be righteous, would He? I think uh, Miriam Webster said this. He said that, you know, a law without judgment, without consequences, is merely just a good suggestion. Right? So, yeah, we've escaped the wrath of God through Jesus Christ. But sin was judged at the cross of Calvary. All unrighteousness is sin. You know, did you know the thought of foolishness is sin? You ever had a foolish thought? See what I'm saying? So you, anybody is under condemnation. Thank God for Calvary. Thank, thank God for grace and mercy. But here, holy and righteous, he, it requires that he judges sin. What the world wants is they want a God who does not judge sin who lets them do whatever they want to do. And they say, well, it's okay. It's, it, it, don't, don't, don't listen to what this Bible says. Let's redefine it. Well, folks, it hasn't changed. Amen. Amen. So those things have not changed, okay? So these folks are not going to escape the judgment of God. He's just, he's just long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? He did with me. He was long-suffering. Now let's continue on here. Verse 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, just what we're talking about, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Okay? So the goodness of God leads a man to repentance. Let's look at this thing in Psalms. Let's see if you fit here. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, verse 10. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Remember that list in Romans chapter 1? Every single one of us in here is guilty in that thing, and he says they're worthy of death. Did God kill you every time you did something that's in that list? He could have. Would he be righteous and just doing it? Sure he would. But does he do it? No, because he's merciful. Does he deal with you according to every sin? Does he punish that thing right on the spot? He lets you get away with some things, doesn't he? He's merciful. Amen? Everybody's heard, well, I'm, be you know, I'm doing better than I deserve. Well, that's a true statement, isn't it? I, I can just tell you from my own personal experience and testimony, 
Um, I don't deserve to sit up here and teach you, teach the Bible to you from this pulpit. But God's merciful, isn't He? But by His mercy, He saved us. Right? Brother Barry, you are talking yesterday, and I appreciate the kind words, but it blows my mind that I'm even up here. I, I'm not worthy to be up here. God's been good to me. That's it. That's it. We don't feel worthy. But I mean, you're, I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, how in the world did I even get up here? Well, He's good to me. I don't deserve it. He hasn't dealt with me according to my iniquities and my sin the way He should have. The way we want to throw books at people, they need judgment. Well, what you need is mercy. So, I'm a product of that. Amen? And you ought to think yourself unworthy, and guess what? He'll exalt you in due time. He, he resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. You better stay humble, okay? So, so keep those things in mind. So, we're talking about God not dealing with us after our iniquities. His goodness leadeth thee to repentance. Amen? Now, go turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to deal with this issue here on, uh, on repentance. It seems to be a, a, a dogfight amongst the brethren nowadays. And first time I'd ever heard somebody getting kind of out of sorts about it was a guy that was bashing uh, Pastor Lawson. Uh, I'm not going to name his name, but he was on YouTube or something. He's got a big following out in Arizona. And he was talking about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, repentance is not part of salvation, which I'll take you to that verse in, in Acts 20 when we're done here. But it's, it's uh, I think a lot of times people get confused on repentance because um, maybe they haven't been taught right or they just, they just never had been shown through the Scriptures how that that thing is applied, okay? And so I want you to, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to try to clear this thing up a little bit. Look at verse 8. Now this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, and the context is him dealing with that man back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and this man gets restored... And this is the reason the man does get restored. Okay, so keep that in mind, all right? For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. Now, right there, is that confusing? I do not repent, though I did repent. Okay, right off the bat, that's going to confuse you, right? Okay? For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorrow, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement, vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now, there's fruit that was produced from the godly sorrow, okay? So right here, it, it can get confusing, but let's look at the, let's, I'm going to get you this big old 1828 dictionary, and we're going to look at a couple definitions of repentance. And what we're going to do is we're going to match those things up with these two here. Godly sorrow leads to salvation. You couldn't get saved without that one. You have to understand you broke God's law. You're sorrowful for it. There's repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's His law you broke. This one here, worldly sorrow, what's that one? Sorry you got caught. That's what it is. You got your hands in a cookie jar and you're sorry just because you got caught because there's consequences coming. That's why that thing leads to death. Okay, so we're going to match up, and we're going to go through some biblical examples and, and hopefully clear this uh, subject up for you a little bit more. All right, so let's look at repentance, the three definitions of it anyway, in the, in the dictionary. Number one is to feel pain, sorrow, or regret for something done or spoken. As to re repent, if we have lost much time in idleness or sensual pleasure, to repent that we have injured or wounded the feelings of, an, of a friend. A person repents only of what he himself has done or said. That's number one. Number two, to express sorrow for something past. Those are kind of akin to each other, right? Number three, to change the mind and consequence of the inconvenience or injury done by past conduct. So you kind of have two. One's to be sorrowful, 
the other is to change your mind. And depending on the context in the scripture, you have to match it up. Okay? So some will teach it absolutely that, well, repentance just means a change of mind. No. Sometimes it does mean you're sorrowful, depending on the context. Let me just give you some examples. Let me flip this thing over. Okay, here's some verses. If you want to take a picture, or I'll, you come up after class. Here are some examples, and a lot of these examples is God repenting. Was that God turning from His sin? No. You see, you have to put things in the context, okay? Look at Genesis chapter 6. First time it ever shows up. Just like a couple weeks ago, I, I told you about the word let. <clears throat> now, sometimes it means to prevent, and sometimes it means to allow based on the context. So, Genesis chapter 6, we'll start in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Remember the days of Noah? That's where you're at now. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Well, how is repented being used there? He is sorrowful. You ever had a child that just would not get right? Does it grieve you at your heart? Okay, well, that's his creation. Imagine if your kids were running around doing all the wickedness that his children were doing that he created. It's going to make you sorry that, you even, that, that they were even made. Okay, see how that thing is? Now look at Exodus uh, 32, 14. Keep things in context. 32, 14. This is why the English language is so hard to learn. Now here we go. Look at Exodus 32, 14. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So what definition does that fit with? Changed his mind. See how that one? You've got to put that thing in context. So when it's used there, it means he changed his mind. Okay, let's go to another one. Let's go to 1 Samuel 15. I'm going to use this text here to teach out of. 1 Samuel 15, verse 11. Well, let's look at verse 10. Let's see who's speaking here. 1 Samuel 15, 10, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. So it's just like Genesis chapter 6. It breaks his heart that he's putting Saul as the king, but the people chose Saul because they wanted their own king, right? Look at, um, now look at verse 29. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. All right, look at verse 35. See if this doesn't get confusing to you. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he made Saul king over Israel. It just said he, doesn't, he won't repent. But over here it says he repented. Okay, so let's, let's clarify that. For instance, like a Romans, Romans 11, 29, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Okay? So, that's, um, whatever God's dealing with a covenant, <clears throat> okay, let's understand the context of Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. What is he talking about? The gifts and calling of God. The context is Israel. The covenants he made with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the Mosaic, those things are without, he's not going to change his mind. That land is the Jews. It's an unconditional land grant given to the Jew, and he's not going to change his mind on that. That thing's a covenant made with blood. He's not changing his mind. Okay? So you have to keep that in context. It, what, is he talking about a covenant that God made with Israel? Well, he's not going to change his mind. Look at Numbers 23. Numbers chapter 23. Same statement. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, 
neither the Son of Man, that he should repent. He hath said, he shall not, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Look at verse 21. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Okay, so when you got into the body of Christ, there's a blood covenant. You put on Christ's righteousness. When he looks at you, just like the nation of Israel, he doesn't see their sin, he sees his son. Is that going to change? You're sealed until the day of redemption, right? He's not going to change. Why? Because there's a covenant. Is there still a bow in the clouds every time it rains? That was a covenant God made with man that he's not going to flood the earth out. Is that still in effect? Absolutely. He's not changing his mind concerning that thing. However, when things take place where, for instance, look at, you can look down at Jonah, chapter 3, and 4, 2, when he's dealing with the Ninevites. Look what it says here. Look at Jonah. Chapter 3. Verse 9. Who can tell if God will turn and repent, or turn away from His fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works... And they turned from their e that they turned from their evil, and God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. See that? They were under judgment and condemnation. They changed their ways. God changed. He's not going to wipe them out. Isn't that the wrath of God abideth upon every un unsaved person? Okay. What happens when you get saved? That wrath gets turned away. That's free will. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So here in Jonah, he changed his mind. Okay? All right, and let's go back to 1 Samuel uh, 15. First Samuel chapter 15. Now, let's match it back up with worldly sorrow versus godly. Look what Saul does here. This is after he does not kill Agag. Verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have tra transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Is that a true statement? True statement, right? He's like, I have sinned. Okay? Don't let those things fool you. We're talking about worldly sorrow versus godly sorrow. How can we tell the difference? Go back to Exodus chapter 10. Let's look at some folks. Look at Exodus chapter 10 and verse 16. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Is that a true statement? It's true, right? Let's look at someone else who confesses their sin. Look at Matthew 27. Look at Matthew chapter 27. Look at verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. He confessed his sin, didn't he? How many people you ever dealt with confessed? Well, I confessed my sin. Here's one thing that you need to take note of. Between Judas, King Saul... Pharaoh, who do they confess it to? Look who Judas confessed it to, to a priest. Now why was he confessing? Did he have worldly or godly sorrow? He had worldly, right? Which leads to what? Leads to death. He wasn't sorry because he sinned against God. He was sorry because he got caught. What was the fruit produced after it? He killed himself, right? 
Remember what Paul said, what clearing of yourselves? Now, I'm going to show you another example. It says the same statement, but completely different outcome. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Some of you know where I'm going on this. You study your Bible, you know exactly where I'm going. 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is David after he commits the sin with Bathsheba. Has Uriah the Hittite killed? He commits adultery and murder. Has him killed. There's no sacrifice in the Old Testament for either of those two sins. Could God have killed him on the spot? You better believe he could have. Amen. Now look what he says. 2 Samuel 12 verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Did the other one say that? Pharaoh said it. Saul said it. Judas Iscariot said it. But look at the difference. The Lord all, and Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Well, they said the same thing. But what's taking place in here? Go to Psalm 51. See, the Bible lets us see into the inward man what's taking place here with David versus the other ones. Psalm 51, let's start at verse 1. Let's examine this thing from the Scripture. If you have this heading in your Bible, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him, after he had gone into Bathsheba. So we know the context, 2 Samuel 12, right? Look what he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Notice he's taking accountability. He's saying, I did it. And he means it. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou may, mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. See the judgment? Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. There's your sin nature. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part. See what's going on here? God knows what's taking place in your heart. See, when you have repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, there's something taking place here. There's conviction. You realize you're sorry because you sinned against Him. That's how I got saved. I don't know about you, but that's how I got saved. That was made apparent to me. Look at here. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You ever sinned against God and you just, your fellowship's broken and you're just dry as, as cracker juice? You've got to get right. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us all from our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, correct? Then with fellowship. Now look at here. Uh, create, okay, verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We'll deal with that, that verse more in depth when I get down further into Romans 2, dealing with Old Testament and New Testament salvation. But he was worried about it, wasn't he? He was worried about losing the Holy Spirit. Why? Remember, like I said, there's no sacrifice in the Old Testament for murder and adultery. The de the, the, it was a death penalty. Amen? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach the uh, transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. He's going to have a testimony again. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. You can't worship, you can't praise the Lord if you've got all kind of sin in your life. And you, and you haven't judged it, you can't worship God. You're still holding on to that, right? That's what he's saying. I, I need, here it is. I'll, I'll give it back to you. For, for thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God or a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. That, ladies and gentlemen, is godly sorrow. That's how... The Lord understands what's going on in that heart. He understands, is this guy sorry because he got caught? Or are they really sorry because they sinned against me? 
How do, you understand, how do you know the difference? Look at the fruit that comes after it. A lot of people will say, I'm sorry. Then they go right back and they do the same thing. You ever done that in your life? If you got caught doing something, I'm sorry. Here comes the belt, man. Dad, I'm sorry. Yeah, I bet you're sorry. You're going to be sorry. Amen? But they were just sorry because they got caught. Not because they broke whatever law, commandment, whatever it was that you gave them. See, it's like, it's like trying to whip people into coming to church. I'm, I'm not interested in that. I can guilt you into coming to church, but it's not from the heart, is it? You're just doing it because that's the letter of the law. You just do it because you have to. But you don't want that. God doesn't want robots. He wants it to be in here. The circumcision of the heart is what he's after. Amen? That's what he's after. So when we're talking about that goodness of God lead to repentance, go back to that thing in Romans chapter 2. All those things in that list, you look at that list, you say, that's me. God, hadn't, he, hasn't, he hasn't smacked me down. And he's still, in spite of me, still even using me. Even though I'm guilty of those things, I'm guilty of death. And God, in spite of myself, still uses me. That ought to lead you to repentance. Of, after a godly sort. Now go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Is repentance a part of salvation? You better believe it is. But it better be the right kind of repentance. Not this jailhouse religion. Amen? You talk to, I was talking to Brother Robert Gibson not too long ago. And that brother knows what he's talking about. What he's talking about jailhouse religion. Folks getting right because they got caught. They think they could, if, if I get right and they see me doing good things, then maybe I'll get paroled out of here. Well, they didn't, they're not saying, they're, they're not trying to get right because they know they sinned against God. They're doing it because they want to get out of prison. And that brother right there, I can guarantee you, knows better than any of us about jailhouse religion or the real thing. Amen? Now look at here. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. This is Paul the Apostle saying this, by the way. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Any question? What kind of repentance he's talking about now? It's sorrowful in the heart. Toward God, I sinned against him, and I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. What's keeping me out of hell? The blood of Christ. That sacrifice made for my sin. That's very simple. So when people are sitting up here bashing preacher about repentance is not a part of salvation, they're just ignorant. And I'm not saying that to be mean, but I just gave you the definitions. Here's the definitions. Here's how you apply them. And here's how you can recognize these things in other people's lives. I've seen it. I'm real sorry. They don't get what they want. They turn right back to what they were before. I've, seen, I've heard of that exact instance as of late. I'm real sorry about that. Well, sorry, you're not getting it. <laughs> Fine. And they go right back, just like Pharaoh. And what, what God will do is he'll harden their heart, just like Pharaoh. Because they were never sorry in the first place. Amen? All right, go back to Romans 2 real fast, please. Does that clear that up? I want that to be clear because I don't want to confuse things. Okay? So don't be, don't be fooled by somebody who might be saying the right things and have lip service to something. Watch the fruit of it. Okay, watch the fruit of it. Okay? And that's what Paul's talking about. What, what carefulness it wrought in you. If you truly have godly sorrow, boy, you're going to tiptoe around that thing. Next time you come around it, you don't like that feeling of sinning against your father. The prodigal son. You have godly sorrow, worldly sorrow. He had, he had godly sorrow, didn't he? He sinned against his father, which is a type of God the Father. He came to himself, right? It convicted him, he turned back and went back towards the Father. He was gen genuinely sorry for what he did. There's a difference. And that's going to produce that fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith. Against such there is no law. Amen? Okay. I think we're going to stop there. It's about that time anyway. 
Next week, we'll be dealing with the rest of these verses. Um, we're going to be dealing with Old Testament verse, New Testament salvation, all that doctrinal stuff, which is all well and good. But if there's somebody in here today, man, you're, maybe you're struggling with something. Maybe you didn't really understand it, you know, about the repentance thing. Okay, you can get right. But understand, it's got to be the right kind of sorrow. Amen? Okay, let's go ahead and we'll pray. And uh, if we have any questions, we'll leave time for that. Father, Lord God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for your precious word. And we just thank you for just revealing the truth to us. And um, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for Calvary. And I just thank you for I'm so unworthy. I don't say those things uh, just because that's preacher talk, but it's true. And Father, I just thank you for your mercy and your grace. And I just pray for the service this morning. Just pray for our pastor as he gets up here once again to break the bread of life. Pray for his health. Pray to keep him lifted up. And I pray for his family. And I just pray for this church. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Okay. Any, any questions before we dismiss on that? If you have questions and you don't want to raise your hand, just come up to me afterwards and I'll try to do my best to answer them. Okay? All right, you're at liberty then.